of you in the Lord's house on this uh, beautiful, simply gorgeous Lord's Day. Uh, and uh, we're grateful that you are here. The sun is shining outside and we worship the Son of God on the inside. And so that's a good day, a good combination. Um, a few large print bulletins are available each Sunday. Uh, daylight savings time ended at 2 o'clock this morning. So if you were here an hour ago, anybody show up an hour ago? Don't want to admit it, huh? All right. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of a ripoff. You young people will never know the pleasure of having to get up at 2 a.m. and put all your clocks back. Our cell phones just reset themselves. Have you noticed that? Uh, so uh, anyway, it's not quite as big a deal as it used to be. This is All Saints Day. Uh, please take a moment to look at our litany of remembrance, which is included in the bulletin. Uh, it includes names of family and friends who have passed away since our last All Saints Day. Uh, CPR and AED defibrillator class will be held in the fellowship hall this afternoon at 2.30. So don't take a nap. You gotta get back up here. That's, I'm talking to myself, by the way. Presbyterian Women's Circles 1 and 2 will meet at 9.30 tomorrow and the Fellowship Hall, Circle 3 at 5.30 on Tuesday. Veterans Day is next Saturday. Take a moment to thank the men and women who served in our military to protect us and our country. If you are a veteran, would you kindly stand? And I'm standing too. Let's give them a round of applause. Camp Agape meeting will be held at 10 a.m. next Saturday. Presbyterian Women's Fall Luncheon and Greet, Eat, Meet will be held at noon next Sunday after church. Everyone's invited. And the friendship pads, yes, you know the drill. Uh, please uh, fill it out and also include any prayer request that you may have. Uh, it's a beautiful day. The sun did come up this morning. And, uh, and we are grateful for that, and we're grateful that you are here. Let us now enter into the main business of our gathering. Let us begin our service of worship. Please stand for the call to worship. Come all who are weary from the past week. We come seeking rest. We come seeking comfort. Come all who are in need of inspiration for the week ahead. We come seeking God's truth, word, and worship that will set us on the faithful path. Come all who are humble open and ready to learn. We come as God's students, ready to listen and learn. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one community and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Give us grace to follow and of your old and all 
that we may come to the unspeakable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Confession requires an humble heart. Let us bow before our God to honestly confess our sins. God, our teacher, all ourselves, while evaluating and judging others, we assume too much and don't invest enough in listening, learning, and seeking to understand. You call us to humility, yet we resist, puffing ourselves up with prideful arrogance and rigid certainty. Forgive us, soften our hearts, and open our minds to all we have yet to learn. Amen. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, your, gift ha your guilt has departed and your sin is blamed out, blotted out. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen.
It is our Sunday of recognizing All Saints Day, and uh, I ask you to look in the bulletin insert, and uh, there you will see a litany of remembrance. Uh, we have placed here um, all of those that we knew of uh, who have passed away in this last year. Uh, if they are in bold print, they are members of this congregation, and if they're in italic, they were former uh, Broadmoor members. And uh, you can see the list here as well. I know that all of you come with memories. Uh, every Sunday morning, uh, when I'm tying my tie, I remember my father who died back in the 90s. He was uh, only in his early 60s. And uh, he taught me how to tie a tie. And he also liked bright ties. And so I wear, in his honor, bright ties. So if you want to blame somebody for these ties that keep you awake during the sermon, that's the reason why. And I always, every Sunday morning, when I'm tying my tie, I say, thanks, Dad. Uh, you weren't perfect, but you taught me a lot of good stuff, and I appreciate you. And I know all of you do that. All of you do that. We all remember those who have passed away. So let us turn to the back of this uh, insert. And uh, let us give thanks to God for those that we remember today. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of ages, we praise you for all your servants who in life and death have witnessed to your truth. We praise you, O God, for all your servants who have faithfully served you, witnessed bravely, and died in faith, who still are shining lights in the world. We praise you, O God, for those no longer remembered, who earnestly sought you in darkness, who held fast their faith in trial and served others. We praise you, O God, for those we have known and loved, who by their faithful obedience and steadfast hope have shown the same mind that it was in Christ Jesus and especially for those members and friends of Broadmoor Presbyterian Church who have, in the year just past, finished their race and are now at rest with you. We give you thanks, O God, for these your servants. We praise you, O God. Will all the children come down? Oh, here comes my little girl. She's so sweet. Hello. Oh, you got him? Okay. So, church can be lots of fun. In fact, during chapel, um, not this past week, but the week before, we had a squirrel in here. And he was at the very top of the chancel. It was amazing. He fell, kids were screaming, I was laughing. But anyway, church can be lots of fun and exciting sometimes. Today we're going to have some exciting. Um, we have a friend here. Would you, um, <clears throat> do you know how to juggle? Two. Only two. Well, let's see your two. Ready? Ooh. Oh, try again. Why don't you get down here on the floor? Stand up. Very good. I'm impressed. That's his first time. I love jugglers. We used to go to the Renaissance Festival. I used to love the jugglers. They would juggle balls and chairs and knives and chainsaws and bowling balls. Well, I've tried to juggle. Would you like to try to juggle? Oh, she said no. No. But anyway, so I think it's just great. Well, in life, sometimes we have to juggle things, don't we? We have to juggle our lives. In fact, um, parents that have to drive their children everywhere, they do a lot of juggling, right? So that means they have to keep things going. So um, would you... Would you juggle for me right here? And if one of them falls, let's see what happens. OK? 
okay? If you don't catch one of them, okay, do it again. <laughs> he has practiced. I'm ready to give you three. Okay, sometimes when I, up, up, don't get it. Sometimes, oh my goodness, somebody will help you juggle. God will send a friend or a daughter or maybe a, a member of the church when you're having to juggle things and you drop the ball. You just, when we get older, we just can't juggle like we used to. We don't have the energy. We run out of time. It's, it's just difficult, but God will send somebody when you drop that ball to help pick it up, right? Okay. Um, Emily says, I should say no more often. And I should. I should say no more often. But when I take on a few other tasks, what happens is somebody, sometimes it's Emily most of the time, will come along and help me do those tasks. Um, and we need to pray about serving God because that's what it's all about. We're here to serve God anytime and every time we can. We have committees. We have uh, like buildings and grounds and choir and we have um, the ladies circle and we have uh, things to uh, keep up in church and screws to tighten and float valves to fix and all this kind of stuff. So, so when the ball drops, hopefully and prayerfully, someone will pick up the ball. We had a friend, she was 105, and she died. But up until her death, even the week before, she was writing Christmas cards, I mean birthday cards to people. So even if you get old, you can serve God, right? The servant asked Jesus, when did you serve me? Jesus said, when you did things for others to glorify God, you did it to me. I came to serve, and you should do the same. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, help us to be your faithful servants. Give us guidance and energy to reach out, use our talents and money to further your kingdom on earth. And when you call us home, we will hear the words, here comes my good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. You call us through your word, read and proclaimed, holy God. May our eyes be opened and our hearts willing to follow wherever your spirit leads. Amen. Our first reading this morning is Psalms 90, verses 1 through 14, 1 through 4, and 12. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or e even you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn, turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it was past, or like a watch in the night. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you so very much, choir. That was simply beautiful. Our second reading this morning comes from St. Paul's first letter to Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. As for us, Paul writes, brothers and sisters, when for a short time we were made orphans by being separated from you, in person, not in heart, we longed with great eagerness to see you face to face, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, wanted to again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord at his coming? Is it not you? Yes, you are our jo glory and joy. Therefore, when we could not bear it any longer, we decided to be left alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God, in proclaiming the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith, so that no one would be shaken by these persecutions. Indeed, you know that this is what we are destined for. In fact, when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer persecution. So it turned out, as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor had been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. He has told us also that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, just as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers and sisters, during all our distress and persecution, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. For we now live if you continue to stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you and return for all the joy we feel before our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And may God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this portion of his holy, sacred, and eternal word. Amen. It's Veterans Day coming up, and I guess I've been thinking about my days as a veteran. Uh, I came into the Army relatively late. I was the ripe old age of 31 when I started my service in the military. And uh, I arrived at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I had to learn a new way of talking. They don't talk in English in the Army. Uh, only a few things I can share with you, by the way, but I've picked out a few. Uh, for example, you don't put on a fresh, clean uniform on Monday morning. You break starch. I'm breaking starch, which meant that you send it to the dry cleaner and they starched it up all nice and neat. And maybe you were breaking starch because there was going to be brass in the AO. That meant a high-ranking officer in your area of operations. And so you had to get ready. Maybe it was going to be a full bird colonel. Those are the ones with the eagle, or as we call them behind their backs, full bull. And uh, we would only call them that behind their backs, however. At the end of the meeting, the commander will ask if there are any alibis. An alibi is a round that's left in the chamber when you're out on the firing range and you need to fire it off to get out of the range. And they, so they would say, are there any alibis for this meeting? And I still say that to the session and they still look at me like, I wonder what he's talking about. I just can't help it. Then the commander would pop smoke on the meeting. At the end of a live fire exercise, they would put a smoke canister out and pop it up. And so that meant it was the end of the live fire exercise. So the commander pops smoke. And then you go get in your car, which wasn't a car. It was a POV, privately owned vehicle. And you went, unless you were on vacation, which wasn't vacation, it was called leave. 
And if you were supposed to be back from leave and you didn't report in, then you were AWOL, absent without leave. All of us have heard that phrase. You might not know what it meant. I had to learn all of this way of talking and it came to me in about six months, I was talking smack with the best of them. In a similar fashion, Paul has to teach the church, this group that has never been exposed to Christianity, to the Hebrew religion, he had to teach them how to think in Christian ways. And so he reached out into the world in which they lived and he pulled vocabulary that would help them to relate to what he was trying to tell them. He told them that they were going to be in a new group that worshiped the God, the kingdom of God. And just as there had been a riot when he left town, there might be trouble for them out ahead. So he introduces some ideas. He calls them a family. Did you notice that throughout this passage? Now Paul calls himself everything in the book here. In the book of Thessalonians, he calls himself the father, the mother, the wet nurse. Yes, he even calls himself the baby of the family. And here he calls himself an orphan. Why did he feel like an orphan? Because he got run out of town. He had to go south first to Athens and then Corinth over 200 miles away. And he didn't know how they were doing. Have you ever worried about a kid? Have you ever worried about a kid when you can't hear from that kid? Have you ever been concerned and sat up late at night worrying? Paul was like that with his children, his church back in Thessalonica. It was a long time. And then Timothy came back and he came through and he said, Paul, I've got good news for you. They are hanging in there. The the persecution hasn't dissuaded them from the faith. They love you and they're looking forward to seeing you again. And we are looking over the shoulder of Paul as he writes his letter of gratitude, the earliest New Testament document we have, his letter of gratitude upon hearing that they were doing just fine. You know, the pain of separation is very difficult. You may wonder, if you get sent to a war zone, what does a chaplain do? Well, of course we do worship services. That took up quite a bit of my time. But during the week, my job was just to listen to people a lot of times. And I remember one day, a sergeant, a female sergeant, came through the door, and she sat down, and she just began to weep uncontrollably. And I said, are you okay? I just gave her a Kleenex or two, and we just sat for a few moments. And she said, Chaplain, I'm just missing my children. She said, this week is opening orientation for class. You know how that you go to that meeting and you meet the teacher for the first time and, and the classroom is all clean and nice? It deteriorates as the year goes on, by the way. But at the beginning of the year, it's all nice and beautiful. And she said, my kids are going to meet their teachers and I'm not there. And it is just killing me. I am just in such grief. In pastoral counseling, we called that a triggering event. Brought the pain of separation out so much. Holidays and birthdays could also do it. But it could just be a reminder, one of the myriad of things that just remind us of those that we love that we're separated from. That reminds me, be sure to thank vet because many of them were separated from the people that they love. People need people. That's the message. One of the hazards of being married to a minister, there are many hazards to being married to a minister. She's nodding her head, yes. But one of them is that she has to listen to my commentary whenever I'm listening to another minister. Uh, we went recently to a wedding and I was sitting there and I was listening to the minister and I said, he hasn't said a prayer yet. He only read one scripture. He, I'm, just, I'm giving a critique as it's going along. And, uh, and finally, uh, he got to the part where he was doing his wedding homily and he used that old canard about how Eve was created from Adam's side and all that. And he said, this is the way that we have, God has given us to have connection and fellowship in life. He gives man to woman and woman to man. And I went, mm, 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 mm. and she knows what that means. 
she means that means I'm going to have to say something when we get in the car after it's all over. And I said, Claire, do you realize that only 22% of people live in a traditional family now? Did you hear that? 22%. The rest of us either live alone, or we're empty nesters, or we're grandparents keeping grandchildren, or grandchildren living with parents. We are in all kinds of configurations. Only 20, less than a quarter of us are, according to him, in a position where we can have fellowship and closeness. And I said, that's just not true. That's non-inclusive. That leaves everybody out. Aren't you glad you aren't married to me? <laughs> yes, I just felt that was totally uninclusive. Paul here says, when you're in the church, you're in a family. You're in a family. You don't have to be married to somebody. You can be living alone and you're still in a family. We're never alone. We have each other. And Paul was everything under the sun. He was everything. According to the journal Neurology, brain memory declines fastest among those who are isolated. So did you know that by getting up and coming to church this morning, in spite of the fact you're suffering from post-Bama depression, getting up and coming to church this morning helps your brain. Did you know that? It's just one of the side benefits that we have of being a family together. It, it keeps us. We live in a culture where... There are several heresies, and the biggest is that we don't need each other. We isolate in every way possible. This week I was driving around, I was thinking about that principle. Have you noticed how, as the years have gone by, window tinting has gotten darker? Have you noticed that? Window tinting is getting dark. I remember when I was a kid, you'd roll down the road of Sang Avenue in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and you'd wave at everybody. You remember that? Now we sit in tinted windows in spite of the fact that police have said please don't tint your windows because we can't see if somebody's pulling a gun out on us. We don't care. We'll sacrifice officers because we want a heavily tinted window so we can just feel more isolated and alone so nobody can see us inside of our vehicles. We have a heresy in our culture, folks, that says we don't need each other. When everything in science, everything in the Bible says, yes, we do need each other. And that's why Paul called the church a family. It's so important. Next, he reached into the law court for another example. If you've ever watched one of those shows with a prosecuting attorney, have you ever watched a show with a prosecuting attorney and the person that's sitting on the stand and, and the person twists, the prosecuting attorney twists their words, everything that they say, he says, so you're saying this, you're saying that, and the person's getting more and more flustered. That in the ancient world was called a satanos, Satan. And so they use that word to talk about the things in life that just seem to block us and fool us and keep us from fulfilling our potential. He said, Satan. And we know exactly what that means. In the Ozark Mountains, we used to have an expression. I felt like I was swimming in molasses. You ever felt like that? Just blocked. You're trying to make some progress and you just feel like you're swimming in molasses. That is what the Bible calls this prosecuting attorney uses that kind of language. A few years ago, there was a very famous work. I still love to read it. The Road Less Traveled by a psychiatrist named Scott Peck. And you wouldn't think it would be a bestseller because you know what his first word is? First sentence is, life is difficult. Not very happy news, is it? He says, life is difficult. And he said, it will stay difficult until you accept the fact that life is difficult. So is your life difficult? You shouldn't be shocked by that, he says. Life is difficult. And Paul said to them, you're going to undergo pers prosecution, persecution. You're not going to have an easy time of it. That prosecuting attorney, Satan, or roadblock will get in your way. But don't ever forget that we also are given more blessings than we deserve. He calls Timothy a co-worker with God. Isn't that interesting? And he uses the word where we get our word synergy. This is what I think of as in the world. In the world, 
God's Spirit is up above us, always blowing toward love and justice. And you know what the Christian life is? The Christian life, we're on a boat, and we're going to put our sails up, and we're going to catch that breeze, and we're going to go with God to create a world that is more just and loving. That's all the Christian life is. Putting our sails into the sails of the Spirit and going where God directs to spread more justice and love and grace, strength and encouragement in our world. Don't we need more of those? Don't we need desperately more of that? We put our winds up in the sail of God. Now, Paul knows how to close out this section of the letter with a zinger. He says, May we be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And this also is a word picture from the New Testament. In Paul's day, if the emperor or king was coming to your city, the leading citizens of the town would head out a few days early to meet the king and walk back into the city with him. And then the, everybody else in the town would greet him at the city gate. And Paul says, you know how that happens in our towns? When the emperor is coming, leading citizens go out, and he says, that's, they come back. And it's, there's two reunions that take place. First, we see the king, and second, we see those who have gone before us. And he says, that's what it is going to be like at the end. God is going to come back. Jesus is going to come. And he's going to have with him those who have preceded, who have gone ahead of us. And there will be a joyful reunion. Folks, on this All Saints Day, we need to remember, yes, separation is terrible. Separation breaks our hearts. But it's not forever. For one day, Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to bring his saints with him. And that's us. Those are us who have passed away. And there will be a great reuniting together. That is the promise of All Saints Sunday. So, Paul says, you're in this thing called the church. You're in a family. Love each other like a family. Love and reflect God's grace to one another. And get ready. Life's difficult. Don't be shocked when life's difficult. No one ever promised that it wasn't going to be. You know what old Frank, Saint Frank Sinatra used to say, right? That's life. Do you remember that? That's life. It's difficult. He said, it's also full of blessings as we learn to hoist the sail of our lives into the wonderful justice and spirit of God and flow and go where he directs. And knowing that one day, as we scan the horizon, he will come again and he's going to have all of those that we have loved and been separated from with him. That is the promise of All Saints Sunday. Paul does a pretty good job, I think, of incorporating us into the symbolic universe of the church. Amen. On Communion Sunday, we like to use the second oldest creed of the church, the Nicene Creed. I invite you to join me in standing as you are able. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we always have a debate. Is it the first Sunday of the month? Because that's when we give our offering. And uh, so it is the first Sunday of the month. So did we prepare an offering this morning? And we got, oh good, okay, good. Uh, and uh, so well, we give our, our offering and I hope that you do too. But I hope that you hear me and hear me well. Uh, I think the treasurer will forgive me. Uh, the most important gift that you put in the offering plate is your life, not your money. And so I hope you'll do that today, that you'll give your life back to Jesus Christ. Friends, out of the abundance we have been given, let us humbly present our tithes and offerings to our God. Will the ushers please come forward for the receiving of the morning offering. to Christ's mission and ministry. Bless these gifts that they might spread the hope of your good news, feed the hungry, shelter the poor, comfort the suffering, and free the captives. Bless us also so that our lives conform to radical love and faithful humility. Through Christ our Lord we ask it. Amen. As we prepare to receive from our Lord's table this morning, I would like to... Uh, Thank Thomas White on the piano. Wasn't that beautiful this morning? Wasn't that fantastic? Uh, so I don't know if he's still here or not, but uh, Thomas White, thank you for blessing us with the wonderful gift that God has given you. Now as we prepare to receive our from our Lord's table, please join me in turning to him 510, Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts.
I guess a couple of years ago, we were um, at a presbytery meeting, and uh, we have a mission church down in New Orleans. I think it's called o Okra Abbey. Is that correct? Okra Abbey? And uh, anyway, they were talking about how when they have a church supper, they have a wooden fence around the back. And uh, halfway through the meal, a hand always appears over the fence. They don't know who it is, but they share with that person. And sometimes the hand even appears during communion. They still don't know who it is. That's how radically open we are, folks. You could, I don't know, I guess duck down in the pew and just hold your hand over. We're going to share communion with you because it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to our Savior Jesus Christ. And he said, whomsoever will, let them come. And so that is our invitation. The way we receive communion is we do something called the Great Thanksgiving, which is just a prayer of gratitude to God. And then we'll ask you to come forward as you are able, uh, by rows, to come forward and receive the bread from me and receive the cup from the elders standing to either side. And we welcome you to come. If, however, you can't make it up to the front for whatever reason, you're a little, uh, uh, have a little bit of difficulty with mobility, then stay where you are and we'll give you an opportunity to receive communion at the end. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our Creator, Ruler of the universe. We praise you for saints and martyrs, for the faithful in every age who have followed your Son and witnessed to his resurrection. From every race and tongue, from every people and nation, you have gathered them into your kingdom. You have shown them the path of life and filled them with the joy of your presence. How glorious is your heavenly realm, where the multitude of your saints rejoice with Christ. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and prophets, apostles and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Sent to be our Savior, he took our flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. His words are true, his touch brings healing to all who follow him. He gives abundant life when evil sought to destroy him, and he lay in darkness of death. You raised him from the grave. He is our risen Lord forever. O gracious God, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out into the world to be the body of Christ. For the world. The Apostle Paul writes these words, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Join me in prayer for the bread. O oh, gracious God, we thank you that when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, you gave them their daily bread and sustained them for another day. We pray now that you will feed us the spiritual bread of Christ and sustain us for our journey until we join those who have gone before in the church triumphant. May this bread recall the life of our Savior and his vital lessons that he gave to teach us your way. May we, by taking it, determine anew that we will hoist the sail of our lives into the wind of the Spirit and follow where you direct. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 
In the same way, Paul continues, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Join me in a prayer for the cup. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this cup of blessing. Here we remember that we thirst and we need the overflowing abundance of wine that comes from you. By your Holy Spirit be present as we drink from this cup, the sign of our Savior's blood poured out for us. As our bodies are refreshed by the fruit of the vine, so may our spirits be replenished by the very life of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please come forward to receive from our Lord's table the body of Christ given for you. Receive this, the body of Christ given for you. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given for you. His life lived in perfect harmony with the will of God, calling us to do the same. Receive this, the body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The body of our Lord. The body of Jesus Christ. The body of our Lord. The body of our Lord. Amen. Receive this, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you, the bread of life. Receive this, the very bread of life, the manna, that sustains us in the wilderness. Receive this, the body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, given to each one of us to sustain us in our journey of life. Jesus, the bread of life, receive the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Receive this, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Receive this, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake receive it in love, knowing that he gives his life unto you, poured out his life and his blood for the salvation and forgiveness of sins, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you. Amen. Receive this, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you, the body of our Lord the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given for you. Receive this, the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given for you. Receive this, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, his cup of salvation poured out to you for the forgiveness of your sins. And receive this, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given to you for the forgiveness of your sins. And by this cup, 
drink in remembrance of his life of sacrifice poured out for you. Let us pray. God of glory in this holy feast, you have made us one with Christ and with the great multitude of the faithful, those who hunger and thirst no more and worship night and day in your temple. Lead us in the paths of righteousness and guide us to the springs of the water of life until we join the choir of the redeemed, singing salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. How many of you got something on your heart, somebody you're praying for this morning? Everybody here. That's what this part of the service is for. We're going to pause and give you a chance. And we're going to do something else. I'm going to pause in the middle of the prayer and ask you to do two things. Number one, pray for those specific concerns on your heart. And secondly, give thanks for somebody who has influenced your life, who has gone on to the church triumphant. They don't have to be perfect. You know, uh, is anybody here perfect? Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they like to fib about us when we die. They say how perfect we were. Uh, listen, folks, I'm just a saved redeemer by God's grace. Please don't fib about me when I die. I'm just a saved redeemer, but saved by God's grace, a sorry rascal that God loves anyway. But that doesn't mean that those who have gone before us don't reflect so much of God to us. And so I want to ask you to give thanks to God for someone who has meant a great deal to you, whoever it may be. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Oh gracious God, we thank you for All Saints Sunday. We thank you for the opportunity that it gives us to remember those who have gone before. I thank you for my father who taught me how to tie a tie and taught me to love bright ties and gave me so many other blessings. And we pause now and remember those that we have known who have given us grace to sustain our journey. We remember them now before you. We also pray for those who are on our hearts and minds this morning. We pray for this world that is racked with war. The innocent always suffer the most. The children always suffer more than anyone. Earthquakes and wars and so many diverse places. We lift this old world before you and we pray, Lord, that the gift of the spirit of healing will be felt in our world. We also pray for those who are on our hearts and minds. Perhaps it's even us ourselves who need a special touch from you. We pause now and call their names before your throne of grace. We thank you for this service of remembrance that we have had today. And we thank you that nothing separates us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And nothing separates us forever from those that we know and we love in you. We pray that we will remember that all of these blessings are ours through Jesus Christ. As we remember the prayer he taught the disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you are able, please join me in standing for hymn number 379, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. by Satan and we were blocked by Saban but it's still been a great day to be in the Lord's house hasn't it to come back and be in God's house and remember uh, that in good times and in bad our Savior is with us to remember those who have gone before us and lived faithful lives to ask that God make us faithful as we seek to follow and stumble along in the same direction that they did let us now receive the benediction of God as we prepare to go and serve our Savior in the coming week. We do not leave God behind when we leave this sanctuary. God's call to love, to humility, to work and service that benefit all is clear. May this call be ever before us, guiding us, inspiring us, enabling us to be Christ's body, his hands, his feet, his heart in this God's world. May the grace, hope, peace, and love of God our creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.